Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. Today we're looking at serial killers that probably don't exist. I say probably because some of these cases are a bit more clear cut than others. Some are obvious hoaxes or urban legends, but others might have a bit more ambiguity to them. I'll start with a story from the good old days of YouTube, 2009. It was a simpler time back then, David After Dentist was the height of comedy, and Marble Hornets had the spooky community on the edge of their seats. In that same year, another mysterious channel appeared called Catch Me Killer. In a series of eerie videos, the Catch Me Killer, a guy who looks like Blue's Clues in witness protection, claimed to have murdered 16 women, and he was going to provide hints to the locations of the bodies. I've had a look and it seems like all his videos have been scrubbed from the internet. I've searched all over and the most I can find is this screenshot and a few small fragments from news articles. Luckily though the YouTuber Backward State has an MP3 of the audio from Catch Me Killer's first video so at least we get to hear what he sounded like. I was I decided to run YouTube because there's millions of people who find my body at time. Whenever my body is found, I'm never clueless to that body. Once all 16 bodies are found, you'll know exactly who I am. Pretty spooky, I guess, but somebody pretending to be a murderer as the theme to their little internet mystery game, it's not all that noteworthy. I'm sure there's been many more alternate reality games like this over the years. The thing that made this different is that Catch Me Killer's clues seem to be pointing to real missing persons cases. He would also leave cryptic messages below videos that were talking about certain missing women. He never really stated anything outright, but he would heavily imply that he had some sort of involvement in their disappearance. For example, if we return to Backward States, their website and YouTube channel is all about reversing the audio of people talking to see if any hidden subliminal messages can be heard. They uploaded a video titled The Mysterious Disappearance of Tara Grinstead. Can reverse speech reveal clues to what happened? Tara Grinstead was a high school teacher who had gone missing from her hometown of Osceola, Georgia in 2005. Beneath the video, Catch Me Killer left a comment saying, I know for a fact that this man did not kill her. I can tell you what she was wearing on the hour of her last breath. Tara Grinstead's case was still under investigation at this point and police had no leads. Catch Me Killer's videos and comments made him a suspect in her disappearance, and so Georgia police diverted time and energy into investigating him. Around the same time he left another comment under a video about Jennifer Kess, a woman who'd gone missing in 2006. The worst thing about this is that Jennifer's father was desperately searching for clues as to his daughter's whereabouts, so when he came across Catch Me Killer's message, he responded to him asking him to tell him where his daughter was. Eventually, after hundreds of man-hours, police were able to track down the mysterious YouTuber through his IP address. It turned out to be a 27-year-old man from Florida named Andrew Scott Haley. It was quickly determined that he had no involvement in the disappearances of the women, or any of the other 14 murders he claimed to have committed. He was just an internet hoaxer looking for attention. He'd never made any claims directly to the police, but he was charged with making false statements in an ongoing police investigation, actions which diverted police's attention away from potentially finding the real killer. He was given a $2,000 fine, two years in a worker release prison program, and 13 years probation. This case reminds me of Wearside Jack, although Wearside Jack actually contacted the police directly, and the consequences were far more deadly. 
During the height of the Yorkshire Ripper's killing spree, police received a number of letters and an audio cassette from someone claiming to be the Ripper. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. But Lord, you are no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. Although the killings were happening in the Yorkshire area, the man on the cassette tape had a Sunderland accent and the letters were postmarked from Sunderland. Police diverted a lot of effort away from their investigations in Yorkshire to search for a man in the northeast of England. In fact, the real Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, was questioned multiple times by the police, but they released him because he didn't have a Sunderland accent. He actually went on to kill another three women while the police were busy searching for Wearside Jack. The identity of Wearside Jack went unsolved for decades until the investigation was reopened in 2005. DNA from one of Jack's envelopes was checked against the DNA database and matched to a man named John Humble. Finally, Wearside Jack had a face. He was sentenced to eight years imprisonment for perverting the course of justice. Speaking of DNA, between 2001 and 2009, German police were searching for a killer so elusive that she was known as the Phantom of Heilbronn, or the woman without a face. The only evidence of her existence was DNA left at various crime scenes across Europe, but they were able to determine that she was female and of Eastern European heritage. Most of her crimes were simple burglaries. She was linked to over 30 break-ins, and she seemed pretty blasé about leaving evidence. During one burglary she stopped to take a bite out of a biscuit, leaving it partially eaten on the counter. It was as if she was taunting the police. She was also linked to six murders, although it was thought that she might have killed many more over the years. When police retested DNA evidence from the unsolved murder of a woman from 1993, they found that the Phantom of Heilbronn was present at the time of the killing. How many more crimes had she got away with in those intervening years? In 2007, she murdered a police officer named Michelle Casevetter and shot her colleague in the head, seriously wounding her. In 2008, the bodies of three men were dragged from a river in Heppenheim. They had all been shot execution style in the back of the head. Eventually, the car used to transport their bodies was found and, as you might have guessed, the Phantom of Hilbron's DNA was discovered inside the vehicle. Two men were eventually arrested for this last crime, and although they admitted to the murders, they denied all knowledge of the woman without a face. The mystery got stranger still when police released a photo fit of a suspect in a burglary case. Eyewitnesses had seen this person breaking into a flat, and yet DNA proved that it was the woman without a face that had committed the crime. Police speculate that she could be transgender or just disguising herself as a man while she committed the crimes. Still though, they were no closer to apprehending the Phantom, and her crime spree continued unabated. That was until 2009 when police made a very unusual discovery. They were trying to work out the identity of a man whose corpse had been burned beyond recognition. Weirdly enough, a DNA test showed that this man was in fact the woman without a face. Naturally they were very confused and so they did another test with a different DNA kit and got a completely different identity. As you've probably guessed by now, there was no Phantom of Hailbrun. What actually happened was, the DNA of a woman who worked in the factory that produced the DNA test kits had got onto the swabs, and these were the kits that the police had been using for the last eight years. They really had been chasing a phantom. Now, the next case is a little more controversial to put on this list because there's a number of people who believe that this one really does exist. I'm talking about the smiley face killers. 
The smiley faced killers appear to have been operating since at least the late 90s. Their targets are always the same. College age men walking home alone at night, usually drunk after leaving a bar. They're attacked and then thrown into a river. Sometimes they're knocked unconscious first, but more often they're simply too inebriated to swim. In a lot of cases, they seem to have been spiked with GHB beforehand. Most of these cases would have been written off as a simple accidental drowning if it weren't for one thing. The killer leaves a special calling card. A smiley face spray painted somewhere near to where the men were thrown into the river. Two retired detectives, Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duart, plus a criminal justice professor named Dr. Lee Gilbertson have been on the trail of the smiley face killers for years. Their current theory is that it's a group of highly organised serial killers with cells all across America and they're communicating via the dark web to pick their targets. They appear to be targeting men based on their perceived privilege. It's always wealthy, successful or athletic young men that are being killed. The detectives have identified 100 victims of the smiley face killers and they're investigating over 200 more suspicious drownings. With each one they investigate, again and again, the mysterious smiley face graffiti is seen nearby. So with all this evidence, why do people think the smiley face killers don't really exist? Well, there's a pretty good debunk written by the Centre for Homicide Research titled Drowning the Smiley Face Murder Theory. First off, the fact that the killers seem to be targeting drunk college-age men. Men of that age are more likely to engage in risky behaviours, especially after a drink, and they're more likely to walk home alone than women. Younger people are also more likely to overdrink because they're less used to the effects of alcohol. So combine drunken tomfoolery with a high bridge or a body of water and you have a much higher rate of young men drowning than any other demographic. They also address the fact that a lot of these men seem to have GHB in their system by pointing out that there's no way to tell if the men had been drugged unwittingly or if they'd taken the substance recreationally. There's also the fact that after a body is found in a river, it's very difficult to determine where they entered the river. The body is often carried a fair distance downstream before it's found, so figuring out where they first went into the river is usually guesswork. It could be that in some of these cases they find the smiley face first, and then assume that this is where the murder took place. On the subject of the smiley faces, Sometimes the graffiti is way older than the time of the suspected murder. This means the killer would have had to spray the smiley face on the wall, sometimes years in advance of committing the killing. Also, urban riversides are usually quite heavily graffitied, especially under bridges because they're usually quite secluded places. The smiley face is one of the most graffitied symbols. If you want to check this for yourself, next time you're in a place with a lot of graffiti, just take a look around and see how long it takes before you spot a smiley face. The smiley faces also never seem to be drawn by the same person. Each one is different to the last, although if it really is a gang doing these killings, then that would make sense, I suppose. Whether or not the smiley face killers exist, I can't say for sure, but I suppose at least some of these would have been murder victims. I know from other stories I've researched that murderers often do dispose of bodies in rivers and canals, so maybe some of them are the victims of crimes, but I don't know if that means that an organised gang is at work. There's a similar supposed serial killer here in the UK known as the Manchester Pusher. The city of Manchester has a lot of canals running through it, and a lot of bars. It's rumoured that there's a serial killer following drunk men as they walk home and pushing them into the canal to drown. Since 2007, there's been at least 77 dead bodies pulled from Manchester canals. 
Officially, police don't believe in the Manchester pusher, putting most of these deaths down to drunken misadventure or fights and robberies gone wrong. The problem is there's no real way to prove or disprove this theory, and so it persists. How do you tell the difference between someone who fell into a canal and drowned and someone who was pushed? Well, there is one survivor, and possibly this is evidence that the Manchester pusher might be more than just an urban legend. In 2018, a cyclist was riding alongside the canal when he was attacked by a strange man. He describes the attack like this. It was 10 p.m. I was working the late shift and I was coming home late. I saw a man out the corner of my eye and he swung his arm and caught me on the neck. I went into the canal along with my bicycle and my backpack on my back, which immediately started filling with water weighing me down. I was underwater with my legs twisted in the bike. I managed to get above the water and tried to get a grip on the side of the canal where it was slippery and mossy. That's when he kicked my hands away which made me slip back under the water again. When I came back up he was gone, I saw him running away. I managed to get out of the canal. It was pitch black and there were no lights or barriers along that stretch, nothing. So was this a random attack or did he have a lucky escape from the notorious Manchester pusher? I don't think we'll ever know for sure but I have noticed similar stories began to crop up in other cities across the UK leading to the theory that the pusher is moving further afield or that there's copycat killers at work. Another body of water that might have a serial killer operating nearby is the Salish Sea. I'd never heard of the Salish Sea before, so forgive my ignorance. And for anyone else whose geography is as bad as mine, it's this little stretch of water that curls around the bottom of Vancouver Island, and it's got coastlines in Canada and the USA. In 2007, a girl was walking along the shore of Jebediah Island when she noticed a white and blue Adidas running shoe lying by the water. When she picked it up to examine it, she was horrified to find that there was a decomposing human foot inside. Six days later, on Gabriola Island, a couple found a white Reebok trainer which also contained a human foot. Six months later, on Valdez Island, a Nike trainer was found, again with a decomposing foot inside it. As you can see, a pattern was starting to emerge, but this was just the beginning of it. As time went on, more and more human feet started to wash up in various places along the Salish Sea, most of them still inside sneakers. In fact, between 2007 and 2019, there have been 21 feet discovered along its coastline. Naturally, this got people speculating. Was this the work of a serial killer with a foot fetish? Well, the answer seems to be a bit more mundane. Quite a few of the feet have been identified, and it turns out a lot of them were from people who had taken their own lives or who had got lost at sea in a freak accident. For example, a foot found in May of 2008 belonged to a woman who had jumped from the nearby Patulo Bridge a month before. A foot found in 2011 belonged to a local fisherman who had gone missing in 1987. In each case there was no sign that the feet had been removed from the body with any kind of tool. They seemed to have separated from the body because of natural decomposition. What probably happened is, the bodies of people who had drowned at sea decomposed quickly and started to fall apart, probably being eaten by marine life along the way. The foot, which was encased in its protective shoe, remained relatively intact, and the natural buoyancy of the trainers means that it was easily carried along on the currents. The unusual shape of the Salish Sea acts as a kind of foot trap, and eventually they just found their way to the shore. The strangest thing about it is why so many were found in such a short space of time. 21 feet in just 12 years. There have been similar discoveries in the Salish Sea before 2007 though. 
For example, there's a place in Vancouver called Leg in Boot Square, named after a foot that washed ashore in 1887. And there's been similar discoveries here and there over the years, but nothing on the scale of the last 14 or so years. One reason for this might be a change in running shoe technology, resulting in a much lighter sneaker that's more likely to float on the surface. I'm not an expert in footwear buoyancy, so I can't say for sure, but it's a better theory than a foot-obsessed serial killer. Okay, so I'm going to finish with what I think is the creepiest story on the list. In 2003, a story began to circulate. It was usually reposted on Facebook or forwarded to people in text messages. The most common version reads like this. This has been forwarded to me by a friend. They don't know if it's true or not, but I'm passing it along. We might see this on the 10 o'clock news tomorrow as the latest big internet hoax, but Joan just told me that her friend heard a baby crying on her porch the night before last, and she called the police because it was late and she thought it was weird. The police told her, whatever you do, do not open the door. The lady then said that the baby had crawled near a window and she was worried that it would crawl to the street and get run over. The police said, we have a unit on the way, whatever you do, do not open the door. He told her that they think a serial killer has a baby's cry recorded and uses it to coax women out of their homes, thinking that someone has dropped off a baby. He said that they hadn't verified it, but they'd had several calls from women saying that they'd heard babies' cries outside of their doors when they were home alone at night. Please pass this on and do not open the door for a crying baby. The story spread quickly and pretty soon there were more reports from various parts of the world. It didn't matter if you were in America, Australia or the UK. Somewhere out there, there was a serial killer using the recording of a baby's cries to lure women to their deaths. I reckon some people even did hear such a sound. If you've ever heard cats fighting, you'll know it can sound a lot like a baby crying, especially when you hear it outside your window in the middle of the night. The story seems to have originated from Baton Rouge in Louisiana, and it seems to be linked to a real-life serial killer called Derek Todd Lee. Between 1998 and 2003, Derek Todd Lee murdered at least seven women. He was known for stalking these women before he attacked, and he'd been arrested multiple times in the past for peeping into people's windows. In a few of these murders, there was no sign of forced entry into the victims' homes, leading to speculation that he was somehow tricking them into opening their doors. As the crimes went unsolved, the rumours became more elaborate, and so just before his arrest in 2003, the crying baby story seems to have emerged. As you can see by this post from the Multi-Agency Homicide Task Force, they had to release a statement saying that there was no indication that a recording of a crying baby had been used to lure women into opening their doors. This was posted in April 2003, a month before Derek Lee was arrested. Since his arrest, the police have reinforced this claim, stating that they found no evidence to back up the rumours. Although this was a very real serial killer, it seems the crying baby story was just an urban legend. That is, until January 2020, when this story hit the headlines. Recorded sounds of crying babies reported in Pittsburgh's South Side. At least four people on Pittsburgh's South Side have reported hearing recordings of children's voices and crying babies outside their homes, according to police. Public safety spokesman Chris Tugneri said police had received four reports from different areas of the South Side. The caller said they heard a crying baby or a child's voice asking for help and noted that it was a recording. Tugneri said that officers responded in each case but did not hear the sound or find the source of the sound. Another news report I found said that the Pittsburgh cops were urging people to keep their door shut and call 911 if they heard the sound of a baby crying. 
As far as I can tell, there was no follow-up to this story, and I don't think it's ever been linked to any attacks or murders, so it's quite possible it was just the work of a prankster. It's also worth noting that everyone who heard it say they were sure it was a recording, so unless you've got a really good sound system and a very clear recording, this might not actually be an effective method of luring people out of their homes. But it has got me thinking. A lot of these stories are well-known urban legends or hoaxes, so what if a serial killer adopted one of these methods? They'd probably be able to get away with it for a long time because nobody would believe it. I'd be interested to know if any murderers have adopted the methods of a debunked story in order to hide their crimes, or if any urban legends have inspired real-life murders. Thanks for watching the video, leave a comment below and let me know what you think. If you're new to the channel and you found this interesting then please consider subscribing. Big shout out to everyone on Patreon and Paypal who are supporting the channel. Thank you to all of you. As I always say, you're keeping the channel going, so thanks a lot. Okay, until next time, goodbye.